guys are well this morning. Uh, excited just to be able to come and talk to you, be able to say hi to you. We miss you. We love you. And we pray that you're having a blessed week. And I pray that this word does something for you this morning. Lord, I love you. I'm grateful for you. I just ask that you would bless us today, that we would hear your words, Lord. It would transform our lives, causing us to change, causing us to be more like you, causing us to mature, causing us to, Lord, impact those that are around us, that the light and the salt that you placed in our lives would go forth, Lord, and would be that which you called us to be. We would shine light in dark areas, and we would be flavor everywhere we go. Lord, I'm grateful for our pastor and for the vision he has. I pray that you continue to expand his knowledge, expand his wisdom. But most of all, Lord, just allow his heart to be more in love with you than ever before. Let all of us to be that way, Lord. As we go through these hard times, it causes us to look to you, Lord. Let, let us to look back to the author and finisher of our faith, knowing that through you, you're going to produce in us harvests of wisdom, harvest of knowledge, harvest of the things that we need to be able to transform our worlds. Lord, we're grateful for the giftings and for the callings in our lives. Lord, knowing that even though we may be quarantined, we still have an ability to reach our world, and I pray that we do so. I'm just grateful for the fact that we can get up here and we can still proclaim the name of Jesus, that though we be on lockdown, Lord, your name would ever be present on our lips. I'm grateful for the fact that we have a church and a church family that though we be separated, we still be family, we still be connected, and that we still be helping and reaching. Lord, I'm thankful for the, the mobility of the church, that it's not in the four walls, but it's wherever we are. So I pray that we're being the church today. Uh, and I just give our pastor so much love and grace, and I'm grateful, Lord, that you're just overflowing his life overflow his life like never before, that, Lord, this is his greatest season, that, Lord, every day has an opportunity to reach new people. And I just pray for a hunger and a fire inside of all of us. And, Lord, I thank you for just this community, Lord, whether it be Harris County, Montgomery County, Lord, that you continue to give us wisdom. You give our our leaders wisdom you give our president wisdom and what to do with this thing that lord at the end of this we're going to be able to look back to you not just a man but we're going to look to god the father the one that has all in all that holds the world in his hand so we ask that you give wisdom to the people that need it most and we're grateful for what you're doing in our lives in jesus name we pray amen and amen amen thank you pastor david we welcome you to our live stream show here this morning. Show, it's not really a show. I'm not going to put on much of a show. But I pray you've been encouraging people this week. That you have an opportunity to uh, reach out through text, via uh, phone, whatever way. My life, I've, I've watched me a little bit online, okay? And I realize that my face is so red every Sunday. And I say, Lord, why is my face so red? And I realize, you know, I've been on a Harley for three days this week. I was with a bunch of cowboys yesterday bucking bulls. Uh, I've been mowing grass out at the ranch. So there's, uh, you know, I, I, this, when I hear the word lockdown, I have not been locked down. And I'm not trying to break laws or anything, but we've done this as uh, best we can. But life is, to me is about going on. And if you live in fear, uh, you're not going to have any life. So you've you got to get out. You've got, uh, you got to do some things. But there's some biblical things I want to talk about. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a, a paradox here, if you would. Uh, one of the things I did last week, I, I dealt with essentials, uh, that you preach the front page. What does the front page say? So we've been hearing about essential. What's essential? What's non-essential? What buildings are essential? What stores are essential? What, what, what are not non-essential? I can tell you right now, uh, I think a haircut would be essential. I know there's acting like it's not. I've seen some women that need some hair dyed, you know, and, uh, and get some fingernails done. They, that's some essential stuff to keep the marriage good. You know what I'm saying? So there's a lot of things that are essential. You are essential for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He, you, he makes you essential. All of us are essential. So that was last week. Faith, hope, and love. Essential and you. This week, I want to deal with another thought that I've been seeing over and over again, and it's, it's there's some biblical times for this, what I'm going to tell you about. Now, you remember the Exodus, the book of Exodus, that it literally is a exiting out of a land called Goshen or Egypt, if you would. There were two million uh, uh, Jews 
being led by Moses. You know about the Passover, the blood over the door of the lamb, the, the, the moving over of the death angel to shake Pharaoh, to force him to let God's people go after uh, 400 years of tyranny of uh, isolation and slavery. So they, they let them go and they're moving to a place called the promised land. Now, they have never been there before, but they were going to the promised land that God had promised Abraham. And after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness because of faithless 10 spies who came, went over and spied it out and came back and said, they're too big for us. The giants are too big. Joshua and Caleb said, no, they're not. We can take the land. Either way, majority ruled. And for 40 years, they wandered. And they wandered through a place of what I've always called a land of just enough. They had manna that came out during the day that fed them. God took care of them with a fire by night to keep them warm, a cloud by day. And you don't even know what a cloud by day is until you've had that sun beating on your head. God was gracious to those people, merciful for 40 years. And they get right to the edge of the promised land. Moses gets killed off. We don't know exactly what happened. All I know is when I'm reading the Bible, Moses took a walk with God. God came back and said, Moses is dead. I can't prove that God killed Moses. None of my business, God. It's none of my business. I just know that Moses died. Now Joshua is the new leader. We find when they get there to Jericho at the edge of the promised land that Joshua sends out two spies. As he moves these two spies out in Joshua chapter 5, verse 1. If you're in your Bible, we're going to be going from Joshua chapter 2 to Joshua chapter 6. We're going to go back and forth some, so stay with me. Because I want to focus on one woman here in this story. When, when, now when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until they had crossed over. Their hearts melted in fear, and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. So what is it that we find that fear does? It takes courage away from you. It takes the ability to risk away from you. So these kings have heard about the Israelites, what God was doing. The Scripture gives us a... If you back up in the pages of the Word of God and go back into Deuteronomy, God told Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 25, this very day I will begin to put the terror and fear of you on all the nations under heaven. They will hear reports of you and tremble and be in anguish because of you. One translation said that God was going to send the hornet. He was going to send a terror out and scare the lands that the Israelites were to go into. Now we find that when Joshua gets there, People are scared because they've heard about the, the parting of the Red Sea. They've heard about the, the Jordan being uh, divided. They know that God is God. Amen. It's a powerful thing. And then it says in Joshua chapter 6, verse 1, Now Jericho, the first city, if you would, of the promised land they were going to face. Now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went in. No one came out. They were shut up there inside this, this fortress, if you would. It was an eight-acre city. The wall was doubled, the two walls being about 15 feet apart. Houses were built between them. It's 40 foot high. It's 66 feet wide. It's a huge edifice of eight acres around this beautiful city, if you would. And two million of them are now camped around them. Now the scripture says, do you remember Moses sending out spies? He sent out 12 spies. Well, Joshua just sent out two. He figured two would be a majority. He's not going to do the 12 again. That's too many. I'm going to send out two spies. So he sends out two spies to go over into the land. And they go over and, and they meet a lady by the name of Rahab. Now, Rahab, if she takes in these spies, you've got to understand, she becomes a traitor to her king. And if she were discovered, she would probably be killed. But she was afraid of someone else more than she was afraid of death. She feared the Lord. She said to the spies, the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. This is what I believe. She realized that he was all powerful. And she had faith that he could do much greater things than man could do. Rahab was risking her life and sheltering them. And she asked their mercy when the Israelites would march into Jericho in triumph. Literally, they said, into your house. You need to go back into your house. The only way that anyone in the city of Jericho was going to be saved was if they got in the house. So Rahab found her family, brought them into the house with her because she wanted to be saved and she wanted her family to be saved too. To refuse to come into the house was to bring death on themselves. And there is security in that house. There was protection in that house. The danger was outside. If you want to be safe, if you want to stay secure, you got to get in the house. And I've heard this over and over. Stay in your house. Stay in your house. Now, this is biblical also. There is a time to, to quarantine, to isolate, to get in the house. Amen. And this time for Rahab, it was stay in the house. Man, caulk the windows if you got to. Lodge the door. Get the family in there. And I 
I thought to myself, if she's in that house, oh, and, and, and she's going to be there, and, and this is Joshua chapter 2, and now we've got to get all the way up to Joshua chapter 6 to when Jericho falls, there's a lot of time that goes on. They cross the Jordan River. They, they go through circumcision. They prepare themselves, and she's waiting on it. And she's got to convince heathen, unsaved, uh, 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 agnostic, or idol-worshiping people of, of this place, Jericho, that she believed in a God that was greater than all the gods they served. And she had met two spies. And I think these spies talked to her. And they shared with her about the manna and about the fire and about the, the cloud and how God brought water out of a rock. They, they, they had to share with her because the Bible says she had faith. She believed. So she kept everybody in the house. And now the Israelites are moving closer. Joshua chapter 2, verse 17. Now the men said to her, the oath you made us swear... It's binding, uh, it, uh, swear will not be binding on us unless we, when we enter the land, you've tied the scarlet cord in the window through which you will let us down. And unless you have brought your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your family to the house. And if any of them go outside the house into the street, their blood will be on your heads. We will not be responsible. As for those who are in the house with you, their blood will be on your head if a hand is laid on them. So on the seventh day of the siege, you got to imagine. Here, there's about 600,000 soldiers, and they're marching around Jericho, Maris. I mean, you see them marching around. And as they're marching around the city, she doesn't know what's fixing to happen. She don't know that's going to be seven days. They didn't get that, that, uh, that rule laid to them until later. So she's in the house, and I can see her daddy and her brother arguing. we got to get out of this house. We gotta, and she's going, nope. Ain't nobody leaving the house. Stay in the house. And this is what I feel about the house of God, by the way. Stay in the house. Stay near the house. Amen. Be with, keep, stay where the blood is over you, where you covered it. They said to her, put a scarlet cord outside your window. And I thought to myself, why did they say scarlet? These men didn't know anything. They weren't a part of the Passover. Remember, that whole group has already died off. Joshua and Caleb knew about it. They knew about the blood on the doorpost and how the death angel passed over. So they used the color red. And they said, hang a scarlet cord out your window. And, and I'm telling you, that's the promise we're going to keep. She doesn't know how this thing's going to happen. So they marched one time around, two times, three, five, six. And on the seventh time around, they began to blow the trumpets. They made a noise and everything started shaking. And this is where I see her stand up and back up to the door and look at her family and say, you ain't going nowhere. Ain't nobody leaving the house. We got to get out of the house. We don't get out of the house. We don't die. Stay in the house. Stay in the house. There's protection in the house. We covered by the blood. I'm staying in the house. And all of a sudden, everything's shaking and Jericho falls to the ground. They burn it. They go in. They annihilate the people of Jericho. God has brought them a great victory. And once they get inside there, they realize that there's one little building, one little house still standing. Joshua chapter 6, verse 22. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, go into the prostitute's house. Bring her out and all who belong to her in accordance with your oath to her. So the young men who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab, her father, her mother, her brothers, her sisters. There's a lot of people in the house, my friend. And all, uh, probably about 10, wouldn't you think? Because 10 seems to be the, the social number that we need to use here. They brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. What made that house so different from all the other houses and the thousands of people in that city? My friend, it was a scarlet cord. It was a promise. Joshua chapter 6, verse 25. But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute, with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. They brought her into the family. Do you remember when you were lost and God saved you and brought you into the family and put you in the house? Amen. When I think of the word house, I think of family. I think of tribe. I think of the clan that God put us in. This huge thing called the family of God, the kingdom of God, this place, if you would. The scarlet line was more than a token for Rahab's family, as it is for us. It's a type of the blood of Jesus. The scarlet line that runs through all of Scripture from the animals were killed to clothe Adam and Eve when they sinned in the garden. The shedding of blood was a type of the remission of the, of the sin of man. 
nothing. Our salvation is by the blood plus nothing. Ain't nothing going to save you. Baptism ain't going to save you. Good works ain't going to save you. Buying toilet paper and giving it to your neighbors ain't going to save you. It's going to help you, but it ain't going to save you. It's the blood plus nothing. Our salvation is the blood of Jesus. When the blood covers us, our hearts, and washes away our sins, we're safe from the destroyer. Amen. We are just as safe as Rahab's family was in the house where the scarlet line was in the window. But we have to remain under the blood. And this is why I tell you, you can't go run off and get scared. you got to stay under the blood. you got to plead the blood. Now, if you're a believer, you start understanding this. You catch it. That there's nothing else that's going to save us other than that. Rahab's family were compelled to stay in the house. I'm telling you, there was a fight to get out that door. They didn't understand it. But when that door opened and the catastrophe of Jericho took place, they had to look at her and say, baby girl, you're amazing. Not only, and listen, I know this sounds bad, but not only did you give your body in order to provide for your family, and you thought, this is the best I can do. You know, I, I quit beating people up a long time ago over sinful ways. Uh, my family were bootleggers, and I knew that there were times that the only way that they could make a living, seemingly, was to bootleg. Uh, and people were against them, put them down. You weren't there with my aunt who took her, almost took her life with a drug overdose, and my grandmother had to take care of her. There was not enough uh, assistance anywhere else, and she turned to the only thing that she knew how to do. She had very little trade skills, but she knew how to sell whiskey and beer. And I never pointed a finger. I'd never be, I, I led my grandmother to Jesus on her deathbed. I think sometimes we get, we, we'd say, don't, don't go to Rahab's house, boys, when you go over there. Go to somebody, go to a, a priest's house, or, or go to the queen's house, or go to somebody of upstairs. They found a prostitute and went into her house. Hung out with her all night long. Oh, my goodness. Oh, I'm glad they didn't have cell phones to take pictures. Uh, and then they leave there, and they gave her a promise. You put a red cord out your window, and you stand and believe what you said, that God is God. I promise you that if you'll keep your family in this house, when the building's shaking, when, when the, we're marching, when we're screaming, and we start hollering, stay in the house, man. Whenever there's calamity outside, stay in the house. Stay in the church. Stay connected with God's people. Don't leave out from under the blood. Stick with that thing. Romans 15, 4 tells us, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the Scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. I have hope today by looking back into the book of Joshua and realizing that if a woman can put a prostitute, can put a cord out of her window, of red and they would stay inside and be secure i'm telling you plead the blood over your home plead the blood over your vehicles ask god to protect your family don't be afraid to pray over your children amen believe god in the name of jesus keep the red hanging out the window my goodness that is the message of rahab here and without the shedding of blood hebrews tells us there is no remission of sins now i can tell you hebrews chapter 11 tells us that rahab was a woman of faith it's an amazing story. First, we see she, she, God created this faith in her. Where does faith come from? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. She started hearing about what the Israelites had gone through. She started hearing about great miracles. There are times I sit back in life and I go, my faith is what it is today because I've seen God. When I had very little come through and provide for me over and over and over again, whether it was a couple of a $20 bill in a mailbox on a, on a Monday morning when I had no money that I thought I ain't going to make it this week to, uh, to uh, uh, getting a class ring back to a, 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 a green rook card, whatever it was. Some of you know about those stories. I've seen miracle after miracle, God taking mo uh, warts off my hands and feet. I, I just, I've walked in places that, that others would say, why, why do you believe like that? I've seen God do too much, man. I've been under the blood a long time. I, he's helped me build churches and pay them off. Amen. Uh, even through the hardness of my life and the hard times of my life, God used it to explode the kingdom of God. He can take a mess and make it a message, man. He can pull you out of the gutter and put you up in the utter glory to God where the glory is coming out. Don't think of that one too much there. Amen. Indiscriminate faith. They didn't go into the city saying, we're looking for a Christian. If we can find a Christian, we'll stay at a Christian's house. They didn't do that. She is a Gentile, doomed for destruction, but was saved from the wrath to come. She's doomed as a Canaanite because the nation is deserving destruction. She is doomed as a prostitute because of her own personal sins. There's nothing about her that speaks of being worthy of being saved. She's not an Israelite. She lives in a wicked land. But she had something that was necessary for salvation. She does not have good works, but she has faith. 
And she stayed in the house. Amen. She believed the promise of God there. If God will save Rahab, then anyone can be saved. No one is beyond God's grace. Nobody's beyond God's love. My pastor told me this today. I thought it was real good. I said, you know, water seeks the lowest place. And he said, so does mercy. Mercy always seeks the lowest place and raises people up. I love that. And mercy found Rahab and lifted her up. Yet even more amazing is that her name is emblazoned as part of the faithful. Not only is she listed in Hebrews 11 for her faith, she is also listed as part of the family line that leads to the birth of Jesus. Nobody saw that coming. I've often said that God hid the seed from Genesis chapter 3 all the way up into the book of Matthew. No, the devil never could find the seed to take Jesus out. He knew that something was coming. Someone was coming that was going to crush his head. He knew that. And he tried to take the little babies out during the time of Moses. He tried to take the baby. He did, took the babies out during the time of Herod. Amen. He was trying to find a way to eliminate. But nobody saw that God would hide the seed in a Canaanite prostitute that he would run that look at Matthew chapter 1 verse 5 it's the family tree of Jesus Salmon the father of Boaz whose mother was Rahab Boaz the father of Obed whose mother was Ruth Obed the father of Jesse and Jesse the father of King David David was the father of Solomon whose mother had been Uriah's wife so God took the seed and he ran it through Rahab then he ran it through David's failure with Bathsheba you, you think what is God doing he, he, you know, he doesn't think like you think. Amen. He didn't make it a, a godly, uh, what we'd call a godly kingdom lineage. God run that thing through a prostitute and through an adulterous situation and still got the seed over, amen, for Jesus to be born. It, it's an amazing story. I thank God for grace and mercy. Think about this. She's going to marry someone in Israel. I can't prove it. You can't disprove it. But I think one of them spies. She hooked up with him. That's just what I'm thinking. I think something happened. There was a little bit of a connection going on there. Amen. Maybe we'll find out when we get to heaven. And their children will have children until we get all the way down through time that one of her descendants will be Jesus. Rahab becomes fully included in the nation of Israel. Her sinfulness is washed away. Her profession is washed away. She's given a whole new life through the salvation God brought to Jericho. She had necessary faith. You know, it was James, and I'll close with this. James is, a, is one of them guys that says, look, I, I don't want to hear about you talking about faith. I want to see your faith in action. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead. Now, let me stop there. When your spirit leaves your body, you dead. You are body, soul, and spirit. Your spirit is who you are. That's why staying in the house, sticking with God, understanding that we're connected with Him, that when we die, our spirit goes on, this earth suit stays here. That's an important thought for you to catch. Because many of you think this is all there is. It's not. So also faith apart from works is dead. So if I got faith, I got to do something with it. So I don't work... To be saved, I work because I am saved. Amen. And if you're saved, you're going to be blessing other people, sharing what you got, going after. And this scripture is so important because I hear people say it all the time. Faith apart from works is dead. That's right. Yeah, but who was the example? Rahab, the prostitute, amen, who stood in the way of the door and said, stay in the house. Stay in the house. Let's protect this family. Stay in the house. I'm telling you, I know the world is screaming for you to stay in your house, in an apartment or somewhere like that. But the real word of God says, stay in the house. Stay in the body of Christ. Amen. Stay connected under the blood. Stay in the, it, it, I'll throw it out there. Stay in the church because that's what the church is. You know, it's not the building. It's been uh, deployed out there doing so many things for God. It's the blood of the Lamb. Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. On the same night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both the people and the animals. And I will bring judgment on all of God's people. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. No destructive plague will touch you. No destructive plague. you got to have faith. Believe God, no destructive plague will touch you. Now, this is what the despised were talking about. Now, they weren't there, but they had to hear it through Joshua and Caleb. They had to hear it from Moses who traveled with them. They knew that they were released. The key to getting released was the blood over the doorpost and the moving over the ain't over. So when they had an opportunity to look at the woman and she said, well, what, what, what's going to be a sign? What's going to be a sign? You mean to put a light in the window? 
What's going to be a sign that y'all are going to look after me, that God's going to see me? What, what are we going to do here? Do I got to stand up in the window and let my hair down and go, woo what do I got to do? And one of them looked at the other and said, you know what? You know, that thing worked in Exodus chapter 12. Why don't we try it here in Joshua chapter 6? So they said, what? Just take a red scarlet cord, hang it out your window. And, and when we go marching around, somehow, someway, God's going to protect you. Now, I don't know if the city went straight into ground. Some people say it did. Archaeologically, they think that the, literally the ground swallowed them up. I don't know if that means that they were, their house was on the top floor of that 40-foot tower. And if it was, it went down like an elevator all the way in the ground and stopped on the first floor. Hallelujah. If not, it, it stayed standing and they went up and found it. I, I don't know how it happened. I can tell you this. It had to feel like an earthquake went on. Amen. When that city went down and, and they, as they marched, as they shouted, and she, there she was staying in the house. Hallelujah. Staying. That scarlet cord seems to symbolize the in type of Rahab's acceptance of the lamb's blood in her life. That the blood of the door. The blood of the lamb. The blood of the lamb. Not knowing that she was going to be carrying the seed that was going to bring forth the blood of the Lamb that would save the world. I don't know if you see it as I'm seeing it, but I see this cord as just a representation of another thousand years or however many more years it was before Christ came after the conquering of the promised land that Jesus showed up, the real Lamb who gave His blood for us. I want you to know this. That when God touches your life, He changes everything about you. He begins to clean you up. What the blood of the first Passover did for the Israelites may be compared to the use of the scarlet cord by Rahab. What Christ poured out blood on the stake did for mankind's sins. The red wine that we take during communion is a symbol of the Passover. We still remember it. We're staying in the house. We're staying in the community. We're staying under the blood. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. Those watching, I want you to hear me. God can make you a new creation. He can help you start all over in life. The blood can be applied. It takes away plagues. It washes sins away. When they saw Rahab walking through that Israelite village, I mean, they went from Jericho to Ai, just began to conquer lands. She stayed with them. Her mom and dad, her brothers and sisters, everybody in the house was welcome into the family of God. I love that the church is a place where misfits fit. Amen. They don't get no more misfit than Rahab and her group. And here they come into the place, and they become new creatures. And the old is gone, the new has come. Would you pray with me? Just pray with me. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Turn my life around for your glory. You've not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. I stand under the blood of Jesus. And I plead the blood of Jesus over my home, over my family. My spirit says stay in the house. When the world is shaking, when there's tyranny, when there's assaults, when plagues are rampant other places, I stay under the blood of Jesus. I stay under the shadow of the Almighty. I know that your protection is upon your people. I plead it. I believe it. I stand on the promise of it. Write my name in the Lamb's book of life. Thank you for giving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you that mercy found me in my lowest place and lifted me out. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Stay in the house, my friend. Stay connected to the house of God. Amen. The body of Christ, what God's doing in the kingdom of God. It's a wonderful thing. Now, a few announcements we're going to give you. First off, church will not be officially opened. We'll announce when the Little Country Church here in Crosby and New Caney will be opened, hopefully sometime this month. Now, I hope to do something kind of crazy when we do open back up. But right now, our mandate is this. There are churches that are opening. 
but they're under these rules. 65 and above can't attend. There's no nursery or children's church. You got to wear a mask when you come in. Everything you got to set in family units. Uh, when our churches are what I would call pretty full. So it's almost impossible for us to even be able to do this. Plus, I don't want to separate our church. I don't want everybody to have to wear a mask here in Harris County and not out in Montgomery County and all, all the different rules. So we're going to stick with what we got. So at 1030, I will be in New Caney. We'd love to have you be uh, to watch us. You can watch us through our the Little Country Church Facebook Live or through my uh, Facebook Live. You can watch us when we're like that. But you got to get the word out. There are people that are connecting to us now that have never connected to us before. They're finding out we exist. They find out we got a beautiful church in Crosby, that we got 110 acres in New Caney. We have youth camps. We have uh, fishing ponds. We got a swimming pool. You know, God has blessed us. <clears throat> now, in saying that, I would tell you this. As you look for a pastor, you're looking for a voice that speaks into your life. And if this voice is speaking into your life and you don't even live around here, we welcome you into the body of Christ. We welcome you into this fellowship. Amen. I've often said all you got to do is show up, pray up, and give up. You can give online through different venues. Amen. Through our office. You can mail it in. You can go online or you can go to our app. We also have an app. We have ways for you to give. But there's something about giving. Because when you give to ministry, when you sow seed into that, you connect. And wherever I put my investment, that's where I am. If I invest in something, then that's a part of my life. I had a lady contact me this week. Her 93-year-old dad had passed away. She said, Pastor, you don't know me, but I've watched you in the drive-in service. Could we have a drive-in funeral? And I said, by all means, we can. Amen. Uh, why not? Why can't we have drive We've done drive-in weddings already. Why can't we do drive-in funerals? Amen. Will you, will you come out? I can talk to you through, the, uh, through our... Our speaker systems, uh, I can talk right into your car through a, a transmitter. So we can do a drive-in funeral. There's no sense of having 10 people to come celebrate a life that means so much to other people. Let's celebrate, man. Let's break this thing open. Let's let the, hey, funeral homes, bunch of you know me. Man, I've done more funerals and more funeral homes around here than anyone else I know. Open it up. Let's start doing it outside. Let's do something to celebrate the lives of people that mattered on this earth. Uh, that's, that's in my heart. So I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Weddings the same way. Hey, look, if we got to change, let's not just kind of group this thing and live in fear. Amen. Let's open it up. Yeah, we can separate six foot if that really matters. I saw something I thought was kind of, kind of sad. I saw where a man was ate by an alligator down in Florida. Bless his heart. It was the worst case of COVID-19 anybody had ever seen. It seemed like everybody that dies got COVID-19. The lady that sent me the message about her dad, who's 93, she said, Pastor, he did not die of COVID-19. He was a military man. Amen. He fought in World War II. He needs to be celebrated. You know, we, we keep putting this tag on people. It's just a, a, a bad flu, my friend. It's a bad flu, evidently easily caught, particularly in the northeast part. I celebrate all of the rural areas that are getting opened up. And the little churches that are reconnected. Pastor, do your thing. Get on back out there. Be a part of what God is doing. Amen. Your people need to hear your voice. They need to hear your voice. They need to hear leadership. They, they need those connections in your life. I love you. Until I talk with you again next week on HolyWild.tv or our Holy Wild app or through uh, YouTube. We thank you for being here. And as you give today, this has been a proclamation we've been made a long time. If you're giving online, many of you have started using giving online. I'm learning. I'm still learning how. But I'm going to tell you again. As you give today, we're believing God for jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours. That you get benefits, sales and commissions. Oh, we're going to need them right now. Checks are going to be in the mail. Amen. Gifts and surprises. Finding money. You're going to find money. You, you hit up money and forgot you where it was. Now you're going to find it. Bills are going to get paid off. I believe in success is on its way. Settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns. Debts demolished. Royalties received. Favor. And my last word to you is success to you and success to the kingdom of God. Hallelujah.